Okay, welcome back, everyone. I'm going to make a start. Um, housekeeping. Um, I will be trying to keep people to time because some of us have onward connections shortly after this ends. Um, so, final session of the meeting, SARS-CoV-3. Um, the overall aim was to try and look ahead to to what might happen next and how we might how we might uh, prepare for it. So, it obviously, overlaps with some of the other se sessions. Um, we've got a great panel of speakers um, and. With that, I won't say any more other than just to introduce our first our first speaker of the of the final session, who is Felicity Binet. I'm not sure that's quite right, but that's how I pronounce it where I grew up. Um, so Felicity is currently head of data for Public Health Health Wales. Um, before that, she's had a variety of roles in in U various arms of the UK government. Um, and what she's going to talk to us about today stems from her time as a, as how she put it, a job share chief scientific officer for Wales. And I asked her how, how she would describe herself, because not having met her before, reading the bump from the, the abstract booklet, I was thinking, well, she's a communicator. Um, and certainly her answer on how to pronounce her name had me choking back laughter in the previous session. Um, but Felicity says she's actually a polymath. So with that. Over to you. Thank you. I said I'd been called a polymath. Um, I didn't say I agreed with it. Um, if I do feedback too much, then just wave frantically and I'll change to something else. Is that going to feedback too much? We're okay. No, I'm going to swap. Uh, hello, I'm Chris. Nice to meet you all. I've been asked to talk about SARS-CoV-3 today. Um, it has been suggested that there's no way to know if the next pandemic will be a coronavirus or not. But, but you know, as a science advisor for my country, I spent a lot of time telling ministers we have some really good evidence, uh, but we're not certain. And the response that I usually got was, well, just how certain are you? And with that in mind, since you've kindly invited me to speak today, I figured that at the end of two days of data and subject specific talk, you might want a bit of a change of pace. Um, I'm going to focus in on a couple of lessons that I feel we really need to learn and embed in our collective subconscious if science and medicine and populations and policy are going to work well enough to reduce harm during future pandemics. And I'll have to uh, get this bit right. So first, communicating well and confronting misinformation is not optional. And that's for all of us, all of you here in the room, all of our colleagues across the world. Uh, so, we're going to do some audience participation. That's nice. So, I'd like you all to put your hand up, please, if you just felt a sense of dread when I said we were going to do audience participation. Yep, there we go. It's a problem for us. We're not natural communicators. Um, there are some extroverts in science, but not nearly enough. Uh, okay, so can you please put your hand up if you think communication is an important part of your work? Right, hold it up. If you've had any communications or speech writing training. Okay. So, not quite so many. I wonder how we're going to get that. Oh, well, Julian, since it's you, you may put yours down now. All right, yes. So, good lectures are really different from good styles of mass communication and and the way that we communicate with the population changes much faster than we can imagine and the precision and nuance that we want with our peers are miles away from what a regular member of the public cares to understand and that leaves us at a disadvantage every time there's a new spillover to human host that's because Science is not really seen as easy to interact with for the non-initiated. It's sometimes presented as belonging to the elite few. I love this cartoon. We talk about apples and the public is talking about oranges and there's just no interaction. Because of this, our level of national science communication is always going to be limited by a combination of what the public are interested in and what the public understand. With any novel virus, even as we start researching, our knowledge is on the back foot in the race for teaching new behaviours. That's because misinformation is in its element wherever there's uncertainty. Conspiracy theories are old. They've been there for thousands of years, and they evolve as information memes faster than biological memes like viruses evolve. 
There are plenty of conspiracy sources who are already, as we speak, preparing for the next outbreak, telling their listeners that when a new disease comes along, it's being deliberately spread to control the masses to support whatever the current flavor is. And it's worth remembering that we need to inoculate the public against misinformation in much the same way that we inoculate against disease. And how are we gonna do that? I think every scientist needs to keep talking about the importance of testing your assumptions. Everyone should be able to question things. We need to give kids as well as adults a really robust defense against people who make universal, unqualified, unquantified statements of certainty. And we do need to keep reminding people that if you get new evidence that shows you're going in the wrong direction, then changing direction is a good thing. It doesn't make you untrustworthy. So good communication during novel infection should point out the difference between narratives that question themselves and narratives that don't change. When we look at vaccines, uh, we've talked about it a lot, so I'm sorry if this is going over old ground. We do need to use behavioral psychology, demographics to weed out the people who are not gonna change anyway. In each population, there is gonna be a percentage of people who follow the rules because following the rules is what you do. Brilliant, don't worry about them too much. There's also gonna be a percentage of people that just won't follow the rules because that's not what they choose to do. We have laws against pet killing and people still kill. But we can take them out, we can account for them in our maths, and what we're left with is a big group. I love this graphic, um, I'll, I'll share a link with it later, because uh, although you're not seeing the whole thing, you've got supporters, you've got hesitant, you've got people who are obligated, but that doesn't show us what they feel. You've got people who are skeptical, and then you've got anti-vaxxers who are just super angry. And that split, for me, these are the people that we have to cherish and support because they're doing what open-minded people, what scientists do, which is starting with a question and without a point of certainty, and then they come to a conclusion. So while we do our research to try to understand a virus, what are the opposition doing? As you can see, 220 years ago, the Anti-Vaccine Society was putting cartoons in magazines. There's a lot going on in that one, to be honest. Um, Reaching out to people's fear of the unknown and driving them away from any possible solution as fast as possible. In this one picture, you can see religious opposition, medical opposition. Um, things are being printed and people are panicking that if they get the vaccine, they're going to become part cow and then they can't go to heaven. It's not really that different than it is today. Uh, I'm personally very worried about being part cow. Um, I possibly am already, it's not sure. Um, but that fear, it's gonna change me. It's gonna hurt my children. It's gonna attack my religion and mean that I'm not clean and pure anymore. Misinformation initiators don't care about individual health or population health. They usually just want to ensure there's enough fear and chaos for them to increase money or power. But most of the people who spread misinformation are not bad actors. They are people receiving information they don't understand and sharing it because they think it's the right thing to do. Excuse me. So what kind of effect did misinformation have during COVID? Fortunately, uh, Therese already started talking about uh, this earlier. So we had a little bit today as well as yesterday about the story of Chadox. Um, I'm going to say AstraZeneca vaccine because that's what we had in the media. The suspension of deployment during the early period of first dose rollout in some European countries had a really interesting effect on vaccine trust and related uptake. So in the UK, we had no suspension uh, and we had a constant stream of optimistic news stories about all the vaccines. And you can see here that the reduction in unsafe in the red and in don't knows was pretty much regular throughout. Moderna started a little bit higher and constant increase, this is from December to February uh, during the rollout of phase one. And as a comparator, in Germany, the don't knows resolved as much into unsafe as to safe. And that really impacted uptake when the AstraZeneca vaccine was available and the other two weren't. Pfizer continued upwards, Moderna just the same. But the fact that some people had access to a vaccine that would have protected them and they didn't take it because of their fears of safety. That was a real issue for vaccine refusal, and it really damaged the ability to protect people in Germany. 
Interestingly, by comparison to a naturally vaccine skeptical country like France, it's even more interesting. So France, we need to understand, has had a different experience with vaccine. So needing to understand the culture and the population to see why it is that these things change. So in fact, the number of people who thought that the vaccine was safe increased significantly, but still, and note this is the end of March, so they're not quite comparable. Uh, the number of people who thought it was safe was still below the number of people who thought it was unsafe, whereas it shot up in both Pfizer and Moderna. The trends are really clear. So what's our responsibility in all this? I love XKCD, and I'm not sorry for putting this up. Uh, I don't mean we need to spend our days being keyboard warriors. Nobody has to spend their spare time on Twitter or X in massive flame wars with trolls, unless you find it relaxing to correct people who are wrong on the internet. Be my guest. I know some people like to do that. My husband is one of them. Uh, what I think we can do as a community is to share our language more widely. We need to help the media and politicians, large groups of people, uh, to understand what we're saying and to learn how to work with uncertainty rather than the political certainty, how to ask us questions. And I really don't like people saying we're going to follow the science or we're going to trust the science. Science is there for asking questions, not leading the way. And we have to ensure that our science communication is able to maintain nuance. In the UK and Wales, we used one major tool in our work, whether it was across mathematical modelling, behavioural work, genomics, anywhere else. Anywhere that good enough research was needed to make decisions on policy. Because although we like perfection, we don't have time for it in any emergency and pandemics least of all. So we need to give a clear explanation of the probability of something happening and the boundaries of what a model or what our current understanding can do. I hope you've all seen the probabilistic yardstick, so I'm not going to ask you to put your hands up. This is the building block, the gateway drug for sharing understanding with non-scientists. Um, we included it in as many papers as we could during the pandemic, because now when I tell a minister something is likely to be the case, oopsie, they and I both know that what I mean is more than 50% and less than 80%, still some opportunity for uncertainty, but we've got a good feeling. I sometimes describe medium high confidence levels, uh, depending on the robustness of the evidence, not just what the size of the um, studies were, but how many studies. Um, what's the robustness? What's the level of peer review? Is it in preprint? We'll come back to that later. So thinking about the way that we can use our expertise of understanding what level of uncertainty there is allows a greater feeling of certainty and security in decision makers. And the backstop for emergency planning really counts on the, you know, the reasonable worst case. I'm not going to go through all of that. We don't have time. We shall move on. You don't have to read all of this either. It's just an example. In our weekly roundup of scientific evidence for ministers, we learned to put a set of bullet points at the top and draw out what they should pay attention to and how certain we were so that they knew when they were going to say, this is what you need to do, or when they could say, oh, we've got some room. And then they could have confidence to convey to the public what mattered. It doesn't stop there, of course. For vaccination alone, we know there's a strong taboo. There's blood libel, mythological associations of danger. There's a strong personal taboo with breaking the skin, which is what vaccines do. And there's a longer term social and cultural buildup over our childhood. Um, we know vaccinations are good for us. We spend our whole childhood being told you have to have your vaccinations for this, this and this. And so you grow up knowing these are safe. COVID's brand new, so we haven't got that cultural and social inoculation to say this is a good thing. And maybe one of the things we need to do is start talking to people right from the beginning, as um, our colleague said yesterday, about the fact that some vaccines are going to be newer and are going to have different flags, but that generally speaking, a population needs to protect itself. Everyone involved in any part of One Health research should be spending time helping people to understand how to ask questions about the information they receive. Volunteer at your local school and go and say, come on, ask me questions. Get some media training if you want. Go and practice outside of your peers and see what they say and listen to the questions they ask and change the way you say things. Our approach in Wales is to be open about how we reach our conclusions we share our process and our data, and we keep telling people, it's okay to change your mind. It's all right to be he hesitant and want to see the evidence. I'm not gonna call you stupid or say, how dare you? I'm just gonna say, that's great. 
Fortunately, the others aren't as long as this. I know Paul's looking carefully at the, uh, the slides. You will notice that I've written COVID down the side because it amused me to do so. The importance of sharing and learning outside our own disciplines is key. You wouldn't be here if you didn't know that already. It's going to be a group effort. I couldn't possibly mention all of the different people across the world who've been involved. Um, what was really interesting for collaboration on such a grand scale during COVID-19 was that we had some very different collaborators than usual. And with no capacity in the UK to monitor adherence with the rules, Google and Facebook and some of the others who started providing us with these great anonymous but specific data streams, regions, counties, data showing changes in mobility from their five-year baseline for different activities. And that was super useful because we knew that if we'd use something like credit card data, there's inherent inequalities there. We'd be getting the people who could afford to use credit cards for a start, whereas pretty much everybody's got a mobile phone. So we can really be able to see when people are leaving their residential areas and you see the massive drop off in April and then how people came back out into recreation, into the parks. Brilliant. They're going out and doing the things that they're meant to do. And that gives us that trending data when we consider holistic outcomes and factor in the likely behavioral response. We think about transmission through fomites and aerosites and droplets, uh, aerosols, droplets, moving water, the ethics of using which data sets. All of that was possible because we reached outside of our comfort zone to everyone we could think of and said, have you got anything that can help us solve the problem of not knowing? So how do we keep open the opportunity to collaborate during non-emergency times? It costs a lot of money to make that data set and we're not gonna have it forever, but we need to be encouraging cross-discipline symposia and cross-discipline working. I was asking yesterday, you know, how many of you have done a paper uh, where you've spent some time with an engineer? How many of you have done research between an animal scientist and a human-based scientist? How many of you have thought about asking someone you've never met before, what would you do in my situation and how would your paper differ as a result? The way that we seek to collaborate changes depend on the people, depending on the people that we have access to, I suppose. In an emergency, we do seem to continually default to having advice from the most experienced, most grand and most wise people. And as we know, that leads to burnout. Um, it also leads to any lessons we learn not being carried over to the next generation. So I'd like to suggest it's important to have the people with the most experience. It's also super important, especially for generational events, to have people who have been in the room during the last one so we don't lose our hard-earned lessons and have to start again. I'd like to suggest that early and mid-career colleagues should be able to observe and take part in senior science advisory meetings, to be able to cross over with policymakers, to support decision making, to write papers or to contribute to papers, um, and also uh, to support a sped up peer review process. Every single early and mid-career person should be peer reviewing the hell out of any preprint papers that come out during an emergency. Um, sites like Mediovix were a, an absolute godsend during the pandemic. Uh, but that robust testing doesn't come without a cost. And we all need to take part. We need to cast our net wide for peers. I want behavioral scientists examining my reasonable worst case models. I want medics being considered by my engineers. Um, a good example of this is uh, my very enthusiastic colleagues in London School of Tropical Medicine and elsewhere uh, thought about the effect of transmission if we had one-way systems in secondary schools. And they said, you know, we can set it up in such a way that we can keep, you know, we, when the buses, Julian was talking a, a couple of days ago about, we keep the windows open on the buses and we get everyone to sit separately. And we turned around to uh, some colleagues who had been teenagers and went, if you were told it's going to be fine, you can come to school, but you have to stay in a one way system and you're not allowed to fight or kiss or lick anything. Um, are they all going to say at their most rebellious point? Yeah, OK, that's fair enough. I'll do that. Or are they, in fact, going to completely ignore the model that the old wise people who've forgotten what it's like to be teenagers have set up for them uh, and, and do all of the interaction? That's exactly what they did. Um, so our Sage for COVID was initially very clinically oriented, but the group quickly realized the need to consider the holistic risks and the harms to the population. 
Um, we identified five harms to people associated with the response to COVID-19. Death, immediate harm, long-term harm from COVID is just one. The other four harms were direct health harms from unavailable health services, indirect health harms, socioeconomic harms arising from the lockdowns or any behavioural intervention, uh, and inequality. So in order to advise and to peer review in response to questions and to have a broad scientific evidence base, we needed to have enough specialists to consider all of them. We can argue the toss about whether economists are scientists. Um, they make predictions just to make meteorologists laugh, but they are super useful. But in terms of inequalities, it's such an obvious vector for harm from every novel virus to come. The same groups that suffered the most from COVID and the pandemic responses in Wales were the ones that suffered the most from Spanish flu. They were probably the same ones that suffered the most from cholera. If we went back and had records for the bubonic plague, I've no doubt that it would be there as well. In poor areas, on trade routes, where there's high throughput, there's not a great deal of money and nobody cares. If you're poor, if your skin is a different colour to the norm in your country, if you're older or isolated or different, the chances are you don't get the same opportunities to be healthy to start with. With the best will in the world, our research population is not representative of our national population. It's highly likely that this is the case in all of your countries. How are we going to change that? And what's the inequality effect for COVID? So in Wales, Dr. Giri Shankar provided this report for us on the variation of coverage by ethnicity. Just look at the gap in uptake varied by ethnicity. 80 plus. There we go. Nearly 15% difference between white people and every other person combined. I don't know how much of that was about advice on the media being uh, from mostly uh, people who are Caucasian and, and not representative of people. I don't know how much of it was because there were cultural differences, but I know that there was a problem that we need to overcome hard before the next pandemic. Just to show you by socioeconomic deprivation, we see the same thing. Uh, we did eventually improve the coverage, but the fact is that months after we'd started rolling the vaccines out, if you lived in the poorest area, there was a gap in uptake of nearly 6% of the population, depending on how rich your neighbourhood was. It's not about schools, people. It's about being able to survive the next pandemic. How much of this is about the mistrust of the authorities in general? How much is about education, misinformation? How much of it is down to us not having enough people from poor areas on our decision-making bodies? Or enough people from poor areas who trust us, who we have a relationship with? I refer you back to Tabitha's um, work with young people. You know, we need to have base level understanding of places that um, middle class, bourgeois, um, liberal researchers don't necessarily reach out to on a regular time. And that's not going to be something that virologists can do. So here's the home run. Uh, I've got a good five minutes left, Paul. Um, this is my last one. My take on what makes people learn, what makes people pay attention and care. It's not enough to say what we found. If we want our research to have an effect, we need to say why it's important to them. We need to tell a story. I gave a colleague of mine a real surprise once when we were talking about COVID prevalence, and I said, oh, show them the sperm graph. And he went, the what? And I went, the sperm graph. And he went, I don't know what you're talking about. Now, I forgot that I was only calling it the sperm graph in my head. Uh, still, these are all my Welsh counties. I know it's a bit hard to see on the color, uh, but basically each of these dots is uh, a point in time, test positivity, and weekly cases per 100,000, uh, this is a seven day rolling average. And at the end of the dotted line here, you can see the place where they were seven days ago. So I learned to look at these vectors. I would look at this picture and immediately see the little tadpoles or sperm. And if they're all swimming up to the right, we've got a problem. And if they're all swimming down to the left, it's good. And if there are some that are swimming in different directions, then I know to keep an eye on those particular areas. And now, you're all going to remember that too. And you're going to think, sperm graph, what? But it tells a story really well. Data viz is important. This one shows something much more serious. This is the number of people who died in care homes in a seven-day rolling sum who had COVID listed anywhere in their cause of death. 
you can see the equivalence in the two peaks, the first one in the first wave and the second one in the second wave. What I think is really interesting about this one is it shows the value when we, as soon as we started seeing the increase in late September of having a two week fire break lockdown, um, and it managed to support us keeping low, low, low until we started vaccinating, uh, wasn't enough to stop the deaths coming uh, for the second wave. But it really did tell a profoundly strong story about how to prevent harm by death especially in a, a final years of life people who have such high prevalence of comorbidity or multimorbidity. These ones are great fun. These are the, um, oops, there you go. These are the unique uh, lineages that we observed by Welsh authority over time in 2020. And you can see collectively the import, um, the geographic analyses point towards the fact that both during the full lockdown uh, on the left-hand side, uh, with the limits on movement remaining in Wales, you can see how long distance transmission is reduced. And within our data over the summer months, we started seeing increased signatures of importation, which coincide with the lockdown restricting. And we can tell where uh, each of the lineages is coming from. You can see that although there were 240 individual lineages, um, actually there's an easy spot of who's getting the diversity growth first. And the increase in size and frequency is telling us a really compelling story about where the new wave is starting and where we need to start to allocate our resources. So operationally, this one's great for me. And it allows me to do my final picture. There we go, that's Wales. With all of its geographic bits showing how hard it is to get from north to south. Uh, this is literally laying out the chains of transmission in black and white. The larger size of the square represents larger numbers, but the black squares these are related lineages. So these are infections that are passing in a chain. The white squares are unrelated lineages. So these are cases that are coming in. And if I were to ask you, based on that, in which area of Wales uh, is the holiday area, you would all say top left or northwest, depending on how you were interpreting it, because you can see the lovely chain of people coming with their own lineages into the rural areas, not mixing with anyone. Um, and so bringing their infections with them. So again, telling the story uh, to people who manage a geographic area and helping them to recognize the difference in the behaviors and the difference in the patterns of infection means that they can manage the risks differently on an almost micro level, just with this wonderful genomic data. I'm gonna stop there. Um, I'd say it's highly probable that using a holistic approach like this, communicating our science more, experiencing other disciplines, telling more stories with our information and showing how it matters to people is how we're going to cope best with SARS-CoV-3 or whatever comes. Thank you. So, so Felicity may or may not be a polymath. She certainly is a communicator. Questions? Julian. Uh, thanks, Fliss. I remember that conversation well at Nerve Tag or wherever it was about trying to educate people on how children actually behave. And the look of horror when I said that my son did like this pretend cage fighting at school. Um, people not realising that's what kids do. Anyway, my, so my question for you is around that um, probability line that we all come to well, uh, love in our committees. And as you say, it's a bunch of people in a room and we all say, yeah, we think it's likely, right? And so we go from being a quantitative scientist to a qualitative guess. How many times do you think we actually got that right? So what I'm trying to think in my head is when we say it's likely, are we, are we actually, would you say in the pandemic, got it right six out of 10 times? That's a good question. I think the degree to which we were qualitative rather than quantitative varied significantly. So SPIM was um, very highly mathematical in what we said. So when we used um, the probabilistic yardstick for modeling, we, we had very clear areas of doubt and uncertainty. It depended uh, how much people were used to putting um, their bounds uh, when they stated. So for nerve tag, 
I don't know how much of it was finger in the air because I didn't spend that much time sitting on nerve tag. For SPY B, um, it was actually quite easy to be um, quantitative because although uh, a lot of the studies were ongoing, um, the social scientists are really, really good at putting parameters around their uncertainty. So it, it ended up being the medical um, area where it was more, this is my experience. Um, and with the genomics, we were almost always completely certain because you could see it really, really clearly. Here's E4, E484K, there's the split. Look, I can show you from the um, testing that we've done that this person here in Swansea actually probably drove or was met by somebody who drove from Milton Keynes because I can show you exactly the closest lineage link. I, I, I really like your idea of putting younger people on the committees as well. And if you look at the current composition of committees, it doesn't reflect that yeah. experience, right? Yep, we need to bring kids, we need to bring regular people, we need to have people being allowed to sit. We absolutely must have the opportunity to discuss safely and in a closed environment without any leaking or recording, because we need to be able to challenge each other safely and, and suggest challenges which are not um, palatable or reassuring to people who are not scientists. And one of the problems that we have is um, you tend to get quite a, a morbid humour when you're sort of trying to cope um, with some degree of psychological safety with the with the size of harm and death that that you're looking at. Um, and when you communicate to people, it needs to be bearing in mind the fact that they have not been looking at the figures and they are not able to have the same certainty that you are. Um, being in a position of of saying when people were unlocking in June, every single historical um, virus of this nature has had a bigger wave when it's come again in winter. There will be a bigger wave in winter. And even without the, the alpha variant, we knew that there was going to be more death unless we were able to go back in and be more, uh, more well managed in um, the winter of 2020. And it was unfortunate that we couldn't get that across in time because we weren't able to be certain enough. Bit of a dark note to end on, apologies. One, one more. So Liz, can I quickly explain how good scientists change their mind based on the data? Yep. Politicians send the policy direction based on their action manifesto or science. Yes. And then change the direction just to spoil it. And they've got to So they you want to change your mind as a um, so city. How do we bridge yeah, particularly in some other terms? How do we extra engage our policy makers so that they understand that that need to change the minds based on the data? Yeah, I'm afraid I had a, a, a rather um, gifted time in Wales because uh, the first minister there and indeed the health minister said, we need to understand this. And I said, we're going to have to sit down every week and talk through new things. Um, and uh, we said, tell us what your what your moral compass is. Tell us what our broad instruction is. And we were told we want you to balance the saving of lives and the saving of livelihoods. So we brought the chief vet and the chief medical officer and the chief economist and the chief statistician, along with um, various people from uh, across academia and sat down and tried to work out what's the balance of those harms. And every time uh, we came to looking at the evidence for the week with the ministers, we would say, in order to balance lives and livelihoods, you're going to have to change this part of your policy and you have to be honest with people. And they would stand up on the podium and say to people, we're changing this because we have new evidence. And because they never tried to hide what they were doing and they never tried to um, stop, we had always a much higher level of trust in the government in Wales than we did in the UK as a whole. I would suggest that um, without getting into the politics, um, what we need to do is have trusting relationships. We need to be trusted as advisors and we need to know 
in both sides that our opinion is going to be respected um, and that we won't be stopped from saying what we think and what the evidence says. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful talk.